So if David and Sandy or Lanny and Donna, if you're watching right now, uh, know that we as your church family are uh, praying for you and in solidarity, uh, really thinking about you when it comes to the stints. Both of you guys have been in the hospital lately. We're, uh, we miss you guys here. So if you're watching, know that we're praying for you. Same with Jeremy. Jeremy, if you're watching, uh, we've had quite a number of our church family experiencing challenges. Think of the Hutchinsons as well. Talking to Mick up in Alaska, there's a lot of opportunity for us to be praying for each other. All right, so this morning we're going to do part two of lessons from Moses on Christ following. And again, the whole kind of the idea is how to respond when God says yes, and probably most importantly, how to respond when God says no. Again, we're, as we're learning, as if, if, for those of you who were here last time, uh, as we're learning from Moses' story, it won't always make sense when God says yes, and it's challenging but true that it always won't make sense when God says no. And so the objective, there's actually two objectives that we're gonna explore today. The first is to challenge our expectations of what Christ following actually may look like. That's something that I feel I need and you may as well, this, the challenge to maybe reset our expectations of what Christ following looks like. And then lastly, to help us find encouragement for what successful Christ following looks like. We're on a journey, each of us here, if we're here this morning, we're on a journey. It may be a complicated journey towards God. And so what does successful Christ following look like? That's what we'll look like, look at this morning. But first let's pray. Father, um, I ask that you would do the miracle of somehow communicating to us um, in a way that we can each walk away with something we need to hear from you this morning. Uh, each of us are here because we're pursuing you, but yet some, for some it's complicated and really challenging. Maybe even right now, there's seasons where it's easier and sometimes it's harder. So I pray that you not only speak to us today, but speak to us today in a way we need right uh, now. In your name we pray, amen. So we're gonna, again, do three more lessons from Moses on Christ following. And if you watched Little Dot, if you're paying attention to detail, we're moving from, we started the first week at age 40. He had, that was roughly the age when he had his first encounter and went off to the wilderness um, and God caught his attention. Now we're talking about when he's starting to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. They have left Egypt at this point and they're moving towards the wilderness. And so we're gonna look at three lessons. The first one, if you wanna follow along, they're snapshots, um, but we'll take a few moments. If you want, look at Exodus 14, one through 16. So there'll be three snapshots, two in Exodus, one in Numbers. We'll jump into Exodus 14, one through 16. Again, just to set it up, where we're at, because I know that you know, the story of no Moses goes over even a number of books. So where we're at right now, the Lord was leading them on a longer road. So they leave Egypt, there was two roads, one that was much faster to Canaan, but it went through the Philistines and the other road was much longer. And of course, God chose to send them down the longer road. And then here they are, they're hemmed in, where we find them in verse 14, they're hemmed in, they have the Red Sea to their backs and uh, on the, a huge, enormous band army of Egyptians coming to destroy them, or at least bring them back to Egypt. And so you can just, if you port yourselves into where they might have been, I don't know if any of you have had a moment or moments in your life where you feel like you're hemmed in. Put yourself in that emotion for a moment where you have really nowhere to turn, where you have nowhere to go this way and nowhere to go that way. Both options are bad. And that's where we find the Israelites this morning. And again, put yourself, maybe you've been in that place, uh, that'll make it easier for you to relate to how they were feeling. 
Uh, start in uh, verse 1. Jehovah now instructs Moses, tell the people to turn towards Pirahiroth between Migdol and the sea, opposite Baal Zephron, and to camp there along the shore. For Pharaoh will think those Israelites are trapped now between the desert and the sea. And once again, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after you. I have planned this to gain great honor and glory over Pharaoh and all his armies, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Isn't it cool when the Lord tells you, I'm going to let this really bad thing happen? And yet that's what exactly what he tells to Moses, but then there's hope. So they camped where they were told. When word reached the king of Egypt that the Israelites were not planning to return to Egypt for three days, but to keep going, Pharaoh and his staff became bold again. What is this we've done, letting all these slaves get away, they asked. So Pharaoh led to ch a chase with all the chariots and picked 600 chariots in all and other chariots driven by Egyptian officers. He pursued the people of Israel for they had taken much wealth from Egypt and economically, this was going to be a huge loss. Pharaoh's entire cavalry, cavalry we, which we don't know how big it was, but it was pretty enormous, horses, chariots, and charioteers were used to chase, and the Egyptian army overtook the people of Israel as they were camped outside the shore of Pyra Hiroth across from Baal Zephron. As the Egyptian army approached, the people of Israel saw them far in the distance, speeding after them, and you can imagine they were terribly frightened and cried out to the Lord to help them. And then they turned against Moses, whining, why have you brought us out here to die in the desert? Because there were not enough graves for us in Egypt. Why did you make us leave Egypt? Isn't this what we, we told you? See, I told you so. We even happened back then. While we were slaves, to leave us alone, to not bother us. And yet, we said it would be better to be slaves to the Egyptians than dead in the wilderness. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand where you are and watch, and you will see the wonderful way the Lord will rescue you today. The Egyptians are looking at, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you, you won't need to lift a finger. Then the Lord said to Moses, quit praying. <laughs> Not too many times the Lord says that. And get the people moving. Forward, march. Use your rod, hold it over the water, and the sea will open up a path before you, and the people of Israel shall walk through on dry ground. So that's the first scene. A moment of chaos, a moment of crisis, a moment where their faith is again ch challenged to the brink. And yet the first lesson that struck me and I want to um, share this morning and is the idea that the Lord wants us to not only stand still, but he also wants us to go forward. What do we do with that? That juxtaposition between Two things that feel completely opposite. What do you do when it comes to standing still? How do you relate to that? And then a sentence later, I want you to stop praying and go forward. So here's a picture of a satellite image of the Red Sea. And I read up a little bit and realized that no one really knows where they went across. Most people think it was, you know, you know at the more narrower part of the sea. But even at that, that was like eight to 10 miles of distance of water. This isn't uh, a little creek that they were crossing. And so the Lord is saying, stand still, move forward in the face of impossibility, in face of going towards the army wasn't an option, and going, at least from their point of view, going towards the sea wasn't an option either. It wasn't a creek, they couldn't wade. What do they do? It was impossible. And so here we get to see this idea, this principle, that it doesn't always make sense when God says yes. God said yes 
<laughs> go forward. And they're like, you gotta be kidding me. And yet God said yes when it doesn't make sense at all, at least to humans. And so the lesson that I present, or at least would submit this morning, is that God wants us, God wants you to stand still in your heart and go forward, even if it's just in your mindset. And again, as we were talking in the young adult class this morning, there's a number of ways that you could interpret this idea, this lesson, this principle. But the idea that I think we can use, we can borrow as a principle when we're facing crisis, when we're facing almost any decision from this story is that God wants us to stand still in our hearts where we are fully dependent on him even in the face of impossibility and yet go forward even if it requires faith that it just makes no sense. It's impossible to go forward. If it is physically impossible, then go forward mentally in your mind where you make a conscious decision that I'm going to go forward in my mind even if it's not even, you're not at standing at the edge of a sea, but you're just hemmed in with a health crisis. Go forward in your mind, but at the same time, know that you don't have to lift a finger, that there's someone fighting for you, and yet still is asking you to go forward with a level of faith that feels impossible. So that's lesson one. Lesson two comes from Exodus 15. This isn't too much farther down, so this is just past 14. So if you want to jump ahead, we're going to be looking at 20 through, uh, 22 through 25. And again, just a little setup for this little section, this vignette that's still very powerful. The Lord had just delivered the children of Israel from Egypt. They've crossed the Red Sea just a few days ago. So if you can imagine, this is within a week's time. So just imagine last week the Lord had got you to uh, walk across uh, you know, the Pathfinder Club to walk across the Pacific back from Ke Korea. They were able to walk back instead of fly. Imagine that kind of a moment. I mean, it's pretty significant. And so they got to the other side and they, they spent quite a while singing to the Lord. I think Miriam led, that, the, led the charge and so Miriam led the host, two million of them, singing praises to God. They have a cloud leading them. You'd think they'd be on a high and yet here we find them, Exodus 15:23 through to 25, starting in 22. Then Moses led the people of Israel on from the Red Sea, and they moved out into the wilderness of Sur, and were there three days without water. I was watching a video about a guy who was doing the Pacific Coast Trail, and he was talking as he was trudging through the desert portion down in Southern California, I believe it's the Sahara Desert. He was talking to the camera and telling him what it was feeling like to be without water, not having any in sight, and having to keep going. So I, just seeing that and then putting that forward to where the Israelites were at, you can just imagine, even though they've had this whole wake of amazing things that just happened, when you're thirsty, you're thirsty and that's a problem. So here we pick them up, arriving at Mara. They couldn't drink the water because it was bitter. That is why the place was called Mara, meaning bitter. Then the Lord turned, then the people turned against Moses. Must we die of thirst, they demanded. Moses pleaded with the Lord to help them and the Lord showed him a tree to throw in the water. And when he threw the tree in the water, the water became sweet. So a very short, little vignette, and yet in the wake of this entire past week, going through the Red Sea, not to mention everything that else has happened, we find them in a really such interesting situation when it comes to distrust of someone who's just bailed you out in pretty amazing ways. And so I submit among, there's probably a number of lessons, but a lesson that we can take from this vignette, this part of the narrative is that sometimes God leads us to bitter places. 
After all, this wasn't, they didn't have their GPSs out and they thought this is the fastest way or this is the best way or this way has the most rest stops. They're following the, this pillar of cloud that's leading them. And so we have evidence that God was leading them and yet he leads them right to a bitter lake. So here's a picture that maybe simulates a little bit what they experience. So they're in a desert, and you can imagine the motion if you're tired, and then you see water, what happens? You've seen, you've heard about people responding to mirages. It's the same thing, you see water, and I can imagine that they just rushed this lake only to find, again, just insult to injury that they couldn't drink it. And so the, the punchline, I believe, for this lesson is twofold for not only them, but for us today. The first was, and you read it, if you read it in a several different translations, it, it can be pretty punchy. This line was just the idea that Moses prayed. He fell on his face, I think is one translation, and asked the Lord what to do. That's the first thing. So this happens, the people are going wild, you know, wild as you can imagine, two million of them. The second is that the Lord <clears throat> showed him a small tree. So something that just seems like it's beyond Moses' ability to solve. He can't turn water into wine. He can't do anything of taking it from bitter to sweet. And the Lord's, so he reaches out to the Lord and the Lord says, hey, do this odd thing. Throw it, I mean, it doesn't stand to reason. Throw it in the water and the water becomes sweet. So lesson two that I think I would submit that we can take from this story is the idea that when God leads you to a bitter place, immediately ask him what to do and then look for your piece of wood. And what I mean by that is as soon as you've asked him, you'll probably need to keep asking him. That's been my experience many times. It doesn't happen right away. But as you're asking him, start looking, maybe even remember this story, but start looking for your piece of wood, the thing that may be the completely um, mind-boggling or makes no sense solution to your problem, something that you could never figure out on your own or solve on your own, and yet the piece of wood that God could use to solve your immediate crisis, the crisis that's happening right now. So as you think about a problem. Maybe you're facing a crisis right now. Maybe it's not even a crisis, it's just a big decision. We see throughout the story of Moses, every time he faces an obstacle, he falls on his face before God and says, God, what do I do? Not every time, but most of the time. And in this case, God gave him an answer that was completely unexpected. And we should expect the same when we ask for our help that many times God's solution may be not what we're asking for, it might be unexpected. Third lesson we'll look at today is Numbers 9, 15 through 23. Again, we're gonna zoom beyond Exodus and the Numbers. And because I thought this was a very concentrated mental image of what it must have been like to have been an Israelite. Again, just so we're putting ourselves, teleporting ourselves where what was going on. We're in year two now of their journey. So we've zoomed far beyond where we were just talking about. They've been in the desert two years. The Ten Commandments have been given. All the instruction for the tabernacle has been given. And it's literally just been set up recently. And so they kind of have the new order in place. The Ten Commandments, the new tabernacle, they're organized in a way that they weren't before. And where we're picking them up is where they're following this cloud through the desert. And I just thought it, it painted a great picture of what it must have been like for them as they're following this cloud. So picking up on 15, on the day of the tabernacle was raised, the cloud covered it. And that evening the cloud changed to an appearance of fire and stayed that way throughout the night. It was always so the daytime cloud changing to the appearance of fire at night. When the cloud lifted, the people of Israel moved to wherever it stopped and camped there. In this way, they journeyed at the command of the Lord and stopped where he told them to 
and then remained there as long as the cloud stayed. If it stayed a long time, then they stayed a long time. But if it stayed only a few days, then they remained only a few days, for so the Lord had instructed him. Sometimes the fire cloud stayed only during the night and moved the next morning. But day or night, when it moved, the people broke camp and followed. If the cloud stayed above the tabernacle two days, a month, or a year, that is how long the people of Israel stayed. But as soon as it moved, they moved. So it was that they camped or traveled at the commandment of the Lord, and whatever the Lord told Moses they should do, they did. Now just put yourself in that setting. What came to my mind was almost like a cartoon picture like you would see in the cartoons where there's this little cartoon cloud and they're just kind of following this thing around. And this wasn't, you know, heading off to the right forced march. This was like going back and then doubling back even farther and then going around in circles. You can picture the cartoon, can't you? And then it shoots off left and then it shoots off right and they're dutifully following. They had to have some type A's in the group <laughs> that had to wonder what in the world are we doing? We trust this God. He led us through the Red Sea. He did all these things and, and there's been a lot more that has happened that where we're at this point. And yet they're like, watching this unhinged robot of a cloud cruising around the desert in circles. You, what would you have done? You would have wanted to whip out your GPS and say, hey, why don't we cut off and let's go this way? And maybe you might have done it on your own because at some point, the waiting on this cloud for sometimes a day and then the other week, it's, you're there for the next year when it makes absolutely no sense, that would drive me nuts. And I have to believe that it was driving them nuts as well. And again, it's pretty cool when you know that the creator, the God of the universe can, is guiding you with a cloud. But when it doesn't make sense, week after week, day after day, year after year, you have to begin to wonder, why are we doing this? And so the third lesson and final lesson that I would submit from this, you know, narrative is that God's path for you may feel winding and slow at times, but it's still a safe path. I don't know if you've ever been on a windy road that you looked on the map and the map showed that it was a mere, you know, 18 miles from point A to point B. But when you got in the car, it probably took a two and a half hours to actually get there. I know we had that experience. We were at Yosemite. Oh, yeah, we're only 25 miles away and an hour later or longer. So here's, this is an image where there's waypoints and sidebars on the side of this road, this winding road. If you can really have good eyesight, you can see that it stretches on as far as this picture does. And this is a, at least a potential. This is a road. This is probably a little bit of the experience of the Israelites, they saw the destination, maybe. It was right over there, but they're sitting here doing this number out in the wilderness. So we're talking about this cloud again, this cloud that's guiding them. And it's pretty cool that they had a cloud because we as Christ followers don't have the cloud. So it's a little even harder and it requires more trust. And yet, if you think about that cloud and that text we just read, it doesn't always make sense when God says go. At least for the Israelites, it didn't make sense. But it also didn't make any sense when he says stop. It often probably times was we just got going and then we got to stop. And then, hey, we were here at a nice place and then we moved the next day to a deserted area where there isn't water. It's that type of experience that they were finding day after day after day. And yet I find this quote in Patriarchs and Prophets that I think is punchy and challenging, not only for the Israelite situation, which this was the context, but it's also, I think, for us today. And it's the idea is, is the path where God leads the way may lie through the desert or the sea, but it's a safe path. 
And so what they're going through is they're going through desert and there's misery in the desert. They're butting up against the impossibility of the sea. They're finding no water in the desert. Either way, they're still on the safest path for them because the God of the universe, their God, had committed to lead them and that was the safest path even though it made no sense at all. And if we zoom out a little bit and pan out and think about Moses and the arc of his story, it's obvious now with the benefit of 2020 hindsight that Moses was in the middle of God's plan for him even on days when he didn't feel like it. There had to have been days where he was wondering, am I hearing you correctly? Even though he had direct connection with God, there had to be days where he was wondering, am I really in the middle of God's will? He called me to do this. This is his plan for my life. And sometimes you're blessed with moments or seasons when you're like, yeah, this is God's plan for my life. You're a happy camper. But there's also moments where you're like wondering, is this really your plan for my life? And just as it was for Moses, it can be for us as well that we can be in the middle of God's plan when it doesn't feel like it, maybe especially when it doesn't feel like it. And so I submit that our lesson, our third and final lesson for today is God's plan for you may feel painful, winding, and slow, but his plan is worth waiting on. There's a Christian group called Mercy Me, and I heard their song, and the lyrics jumped out. If you've ever had lyrics speak to you, there was plenty of lyrics in the song, but three phrases spoke to me, and I thought they'd maybe speak to you. Within the context, as we're starting to transition away from the story of Moses, to think, how do we apply these lessons this morning to us right now? You're facing something right now, or you have, or you will be. And I found these lyrics meaningful. I know the sorrow and I know the hurt would go, all go away if you just say the word. But even if you don't, my hope is in you alone. You can think about Moses and him saying that to God. There were moments where there was plenty of sorrow in his life, especially at the end. But even if you don't, my hope is in you alone. I know you're able, and I know that you can save through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if you don't, my hope is in you alone. There's a moment or moments that you've had where you've been tested to the point where you have to make a decision if you're going to continue to trust and make that decision that even though my circumstances are this, my hope is still in you alone. The last phrase, but God, when you choose to leave mountains unmovable, oh, give me the strength to sing it is well with my soul. You've had mountains unmovable. You probably still do. Oh, give me, oh, give us the strength to sing it is well with my soul during that moment. So what's the punchline? What's the punchline for us? When it feels impossible, stand still in your heart and yet move forward, even if it's just in your mind. And if it's not in your mind, if there's something you can tangibly do, but it could fail or there's fear wrapped like a cloak all around it, stand still in your heart Move forward, even if it makes just as much sense as crossing over the Red Sea and holding out your rod. No one had ever done that before. When it feels impossible, go ahead in your heart. Be still and yet still go forward. That's, that re that's challenging. And yet, if we think about Moses' story, it's something that we can experiment with. The second lesson, when God leads you to a better place, immediately ask him what to do and look for your piece of wood. Ask him when you hit something next week that just you don't know what to do. As quick as you can, ask for help. And if it takes you two hours before you do that, 
then try and next time break it down to an hour. But when, once you ask him, and it'll probably be a few times, especially if it's a major challenge that is like crossing the Red Sea, start looking once you've asked him in faith, looking for that piece of wood, that tree to throw in the water. It again makes no sense. But God is a God that doesn't always make sense. Lesson three, God's plan for you may feel painful, winding, painfully slow. But his plan is worth waiting on. If we look at the whole narrative of Moses' story, but all the stories that are filled the Bible with, each of those heroes, the plan was worth waiting on no matter what waiting looked like. Because... The path where God leads the way may lie through a desert or a sea. And for you, your desert may be bitter. You may have evidences of God, but then those evidences just seem so far away in the face of this new challenge. You may have a sea. You may have something in your life that feels absolutely impossible. You do not have the strength to even begin to move forward. Either way, if, if your experience is a desert or a sea, we can trust that if we're following God, if he has permission to guide the path of our lives, that it's a safe path, especially when it doesn't make sense. Let's bow our heads. Father, Help us to discover a trust where we can accept your plan for us, knowing there's risk with that, that there may be times that we'll be delirious with delight, but we also know there may be moments and times where it won't make sense at all Help us to trust you to the extent that we can say it is well with our soul in the middle of moments that make no sense at all. Help us to have an experience like Moses where we can follow you even though we don't have the benefit even of a visible cloud, to follow you, to give you the pen, so to speak, each morning, each, morning, each day, giving that to you and letting you guide our lives and trusting you, especially on the days it doesn't make sense. In your name we pray, amen. I hope you have a wonderful Sabbath. Thank you for being here this morning. I hope you have a terrific week.